7 o'clock, and it's time to call this board meeting of the Desire City School District to order. Roll call, please. Mr. Murphy? Here. Dr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Schieffer? Here. Mrs. Stone? Here. Mr. Stone? Thank you. <laughs> Would you all please stand and join in the Pledge of Allegiance? <coughs> Uh, we have several students that, that will come in and take regular classes. 
uh, and go into our educational options uh, uh, room, which is a, a picture of part of the room there, uh, and, then, and then return to our building to finish out their day. We have credit recovery opportunity at the end of the day, uh, also during the day if uh, the student has a study hall. Uh, credit advancement uh, for someone who wants to take more of an advanced course that we may not offer. And then we also have OGT or test prep classes that students can be involved in. Uh, our program offers uh, our students, if they, if they stay with us and stay in our program, they'll get a Bucyrus High School Diploma, which we feel is, is very important um, uh, as compared to maybe some of those digital schools. Uh, we've had some students that have finished in the digital school that have come back and said uh, that you know those diplomas don't go near as far with employers uh, because it, it, they well, one student shared with me because it sends the wrong message about you couldn't do school so you you get to stay with us you're our you're our student you get a high school diploma uh, and if you're on track to graduate you'll graduate with your own class uh, we have community counseling uh, right in our building and we can we can set families up and students up with with that uh, they can have access to our food service. Um, there's real-time support from licensed teachers. Uh, that's one, uh, one concern, one major concern from students who come back to us from Trekker or Goal or those online programs that they can't get the support they need. And not only do we have the tech support on-site on every day, but we have uh, two highly qualified staff members in the room to help those students through issues they may have. We have special education support not only in the back building, uh, Mrs. Noyes, uh, Ms. Noyes is a uh, special ed instructor, uh, but we also have all the special ed uh, experts in our building. Uh, we have job readiness uh, support and work study credit uh, with Mr. Hall's experience with CBI and how the work study credit works uh, for students. Uh, that's an option for our kiddos as well. Uh, and they can also participate in school events. We had several students that have done well in the program that attended homecoming uh, recently. Uh, and we have some that are eligible to play sports if they so choose. <coughs> so school events are still an option for them, uh, and at an online school they would not. Uh, it's customizable. Uh, students can have their own, they can have a flexible schedule, classes on their own time. I know there are several students that are sitting in here right now that, if I'm not mistaken, and, and the teachers or the, direct, uh, you know, the director uh, foreman can help me here, uh, we're working 40 hours a week or more uh, on some classes. And so they're doing more time in a class than what students that would actually just be coming to school would spend. Um, and, uh, and so that's awesome, that they can actually accelerate their class completion. And, and so uh, those who we brought in front of you today are doing just that. Their attendance is, is near perfect, if not perfect. Um, they're already earning credits. Uh, some of our students are on pace to earn, if they would keep up at this pace, earning 10 to 12 credits a year, which is more than what you can earn in a traditional school setting. Um, and so it's completely customizable. and. You know, you can work, um, again, at your pace, and it can be faster than, than, than maybe in a traditional classroom. And I think what makes the big part, the big difference in this program is uh, the Redmond family. You, you know, you're still are, you're still with us, and, uh, and students remain part of the Redmond family. Now, the students will be able to stay with their graduating class if, if the, as long as they're earning their credits or doing credit, um, uh, credit uh, attainment or credit recovery. You can participate in advance. You have access to all of our teachers, even though we have some students that are in the back building, they still have access to the teachers up front. Um, you know, if they ask and we get that set up for them. And they have the guidance from our uh, guidance counselors and the office staff. And, you know, again, they're still one of ours. They're still part of our family. And so I think that's what makes the biggest difference uh, in our program. Um, at this time, I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Foreman to come up front. And uh, I do apologize for the students that did come because I actually pulled your last year's pictures off our website. So you are all much more mature and beautiful now than you were last year. But there you are. Sorry. Uh, the first student uh, is Michael Lohr. Uh, he works in our um, Ed Options program. And he also, I believe, works a full-time job, second, second shift. shift. And so this works for him. And so even though we knew he couldn't come, to the meeting, we still wanted a certificate, and we still wanted to, to uh, introduce you to Michael. He's doing very well in this program, and it's working for him. Kendra Keaton is with us. You can come forward, you can get your certificate from Mr. Foreman. And Mrs. Keaton is doing an excellent job in the program, and so stay up front if you would, please, with Mr. Foreman. Uh, Gabby Avar, Avar uh, isn't with us. Uh, but she's doing very well in the program, and again, is trying to um, uh, earn, earn credit for graduation, and we're very hopeful that uh, this program will be successful for her uh, in getting to uh, graduation. Haley Eisen is with us. Come forward. Starla John. 
Wisconsin for. Um, and the letter that we sent uh, to our uh, students that we recognize uh, tonight, we, we said, you know, basically they were pioneers in this program. We just started this. I like to say that we're, we're building the plane while in the air. Uh, we don't know what this program is ultimately going to be. Um, but it's, it's young people that, you know, the pictures you saw up here, the young people with us today, um, they're the reason that this program will be successful. And uh, the more uh, young people like, like you see before you today, the more we get into that program, ultimately it's just, it's just going to be amazing what we're going to be able to achieve. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends and family, educational options students. Our students uh, and families out front where we'll get a picture. Staff, I'd like you to be involved in that picture as well if you would. Please. I'd like to say a few words before we leave. Uh, I want to also congratulate you students. Um, do know that we're working hard on the background to provide you some incentives even that you don't know about yet. Uh, Mr. Foreman, Dr. Burke and I met with uh, Verizon today. We're trying to pilot some devices to get in your hands so that you can uh, potentially do some school work not just at school but at home. And we're going to use the five students that are recognized tonight. We're going to get tablets in your hands, internet access at home, those type of things so that uh, you can provide us feedback on what potentially tools and resources you need to continue your schooling and be successful. So uh, do know we're trying our best to get those uh, things worked out for you. Um, I appreciate all the work that uh, uh, our teachers, Mr. Uh, uh, Hall and, and Ms. Noyes, is doing back there and under the direction and leadership of Mr. Foreman. So it, uh, anything you guys would like to say about the program or how things are going? I just really like to thank and congratulate these the, the kids we have today. I mean, you guys are doing a bang up job, I think. What did we have? 15 now? 18. 18 completed. since the school started. 18 courses completed by our students back there. And these, the five here are probably between them about 10, 10 or 11. So I do you know if they're sitting in the job. front building nine weeks in, they wouldn't have completed any courses yet. So uh, I think it really, uh, it's a focus. It does take the right uh, uh, attitude, I think, to know that, hey, my ultimate goal is to get the high school diploma, no matter what it takes. And uh, uh, they're progressing through that very nicely. So, yes. Can I say something, please? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, sorry, guys. I really have to say this. Um, at the beginning of this year, I found out I needed 12 and a half credits just to graduate this year, and I bawled my eyes out in front of this man right here and my assistant principal, and I am just so thankful to be in this program because I am already into my third class, halfway through it, and it's giving me a chance that I've never gotten in my life. And I just, I thank my teachers for helping me all the way through this. Mr. Hall sits with me, helps me take my test. Something I didn't get. I was in the Ohio Virtual Academy last year, and I failed. I failed every class because I did not have the help that I get here. So I just want to thank all of you guys for making this possible for me and everybody else. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And uh, appreciate your time. Keep up the good work. All right, now it's about your time. All right. <laughs> <laughs>
question. I have done something right, people. <laughs> <laughs> it's exciting times. You know, and, and, and what we weren't banking on um, is the, the climate change of the, uh, of the front building. And not that these kids are bad kids or great kids that are in that program, but they weren't happy in a regular classroom. Mm -hmm. Thus, they were a distraction, which took away from kids that did want to do the right thing. I've been told, and I've been—I felt when I've been in there that it's a total climate change, the culture change in the, in the in the main building because you got kids back there that are learning the way they want to learn, that interests them at their own pace, not being distracted by others. And then on the flip side, that the traditional classrooms are are progressing because of the, the distractions. So it's it's helped out both sides of the of the world. So. I think you have the right people back there too, in the valley. It continues to grow. I will tell you that, as Starla said, 24 credits is what we need to graduate. We're in competition with schools, online schools, that require 21. That's still a hurdle that we have to look at very closely this year. I don't believe it's low on our standards because those kids that are doing what they need to do don't pay attention once they get to 24 and stop working. We got kids graduating 29, 30, 32 credits. That's not going to change. Mm -hmm. But what will change is looking at a kid and saying, you can make it. You're eight classes away as opposed to 12 classes away or 11 classes away. And that, that you may think three doesn't mean a whole lot, but it's a mound of these kids that have struggled. So we've got to look at that graduation requirement very closely this year before the end of the school year. Everyone showing up just how much you care about the students being successful. All right. Thank you. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes from the September 26, 2013 regular meeting? So moved. Okay. Any questions or comments? Roll call, please. Mr. Schieffer? Yes. Dr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Murr? Yes. Mrs. Stone? Yes. We have a motion to approve the Treasurer's financial report dated September 30th, 2013. So moved. Support. Got anything you want to share with us uh, this evening? A couple little things. The primary focus tonight for me will be in the back when we get to the five year forecast. Uh, September we saw uh, continued deficit spending in the general fund. We're still positive for the year, but we'll discuss that in greater detail as we get into the five-year forecast. Uh, the results of House Bill 59 are positive for the district. Again, I'll refer in greater detail to the five-year forecast and, and cover where we were projected, where we're at now, and, and where we're looking to be. Um, again, tonight, one important item that is on the agenda for your consideration is the change of insurance consortium from Omarisa to OSBC. We have received assurance from Homer Risa since our last board meeting that we will be able to terminate that relationship without penalties. I know we approved the move, but they have confirmed. Um, their superintendent actually met with uh, Mr. Kimmel a week or so ago for another item and confirmed that, that we're okay and good standing with them on that, that regard. With that, I will conclude my perfect report. Any questions for Ryan? Please. Mr. Murray? Mm -hmm. Yes. Dr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Schieffer? Yes. Mrs. Stone? Yes. Well, I don't believe we have an addendum this evening, do we? No, we do not. We will go to committee reports. Athletics, Mr. Schieffer. Well, we're getting close to the season coming to a close here for the fall. Um, mm. Some of the sports have already concluded this season. The girls cross country team and uh, Coach Rittenauer, I think it's the first time that the girls won an NCC title. And, uh, so much to be proud of with that. Um, pretty soon, uh, the final 
finalizing having the, the banquets and uh, with that we'll be starting up with uh, the winter sports season um, we'll get upon us then. so but before we conclude um, tomorrow night last home game big rivalry the Galleon New Sutter's game is the longest day in rivalry and uh, one of the longest in the state about 117 years of this yeah. school football, right? Yes. And uh, the playoff folks are still alive. They put up the yes, uh, polar points of uh, the state ranked team. Like that. So it should be a good game. It's going to be a little cold, but it uh, <laughs> shouldn't bother. So with that, uh, I think we're just going forward. Thanks, Doug. Pioneer met Monday evening, and it was business as usual for this time of year. I don't know if anybody was out and about for the last week, and or saw, you know, the paper where the Pioneer students were out in their home districts doing community service work. So I believe they were. I believe they hit every district doing something for the day. Student achievement, Dr. Johnson. Uh, I was in a meeting today with some state folks that represent different age, age, education agencies in the state, and, and one of the issues that came up was this freshman class is going to be subjected to probably more testing than any other class in the 150 years that we've been around. Um, because they, they're going to have the PSAT in the fall, and they're going to have the OGT still. <coughs> And nobody can quite figure out and why we're still exam. doing that. And, and then they're going to be exam. end of course exams late in the spring. So there's going to be lots of lots of testing. I like to term that opportunities, but I don't know that's an opportunity. I think it's in some cases time away from classroom instruction. Um, another related issue, I'm sure you're aware, there's some concern about the capacity of districts to do all this testing online and whether districts have the bandwidth for the computers. And in the case of third graders, are third graders ready to, to do this in response to online testing? So there seems to be lots of questions about that. And it seems like we're moving away from cursive to keyboarding like in one year. <laughs> so um, just some, some issues out there that, that seem to be on the top of everybody's uh, mind. And I, one person said, you know, it's only October, but everybody around the state in education seems to have their May face on it's like all this is just coming down so fast that it's, it's something to, for people to deal with. So that concludes my report. And the thing of it is, it can change. Yeah, when the legislature right. change, when the legislators change, this whole thing can change. And it's <coughs> crazy. Well, Miss Mr. Murdo. Well, in addition to the two thousand dollar grant that we received. Um, from the Elks. Um, we were also approved through the Second Harvest uh, to be a food bank and, uh, through the, for the uh, backpack program. Um, continue to need assistance to stock shelves, especially with the, uh, the purchase of the, the food, um, but um, uh, as well as the, uh, the packing of said backpacks. Um, the stocking of shelves, uh, speaking of Lori, uh, that's not yet been nailed down as far as specific dates and times, but uh, always help needing, uh, or always needing help for uh, packing backpacks on Thursday afternoons, 3 o'clock. And it doesn't take long. <coughs> I'm here maybe 45 minutes when I'm here. Yeah. It's not bad. They got a system. Mm. Well, in a couple of weeks, you'll have all the help you can. That's it. That's it. All right, and our student representative is not here this evening. So we will go to the superintendent's report. President uh, Stone, members of the board, my meeting or my report will be brief because I have a large, and I'll try to summarize the best I can, board policy review tonight. So, um, first, I'd like to, to announce uh, we're at the end of the first nine weeks already. Uh, parent teacher conferences were going on yesterday, or last night, today, tonight tomorrow morning um, and uh, actually no all the conferences are done 
as of tonight. As so uh, did, yeah. double duty, you know, on Wednesday night, all day today, and all t and tonight. So they're off tomorrow. Um, it's the first night we just went it's very smooth. Um, I've yet to see a kid recommended to me yet. Or I know. So, but uh, try not to let the blood wounds go open. Um, the, the principals and administration are doing a wonderful job in the buildings. Uh, very pleased with our Supreme Court visit yesterday and uh, would have not been possible without Dr. Burke and his leadership uh, and his staff and students were wonderful. Um, heard many, many positive comments uh, from the mayor all the way to the Supreme Court staff. So they were better treated here. It was well run than any other place I've ever been. So kudos to, to you, Dr. Burke, and your staff. Uh, it, it dates all the way back to, to, to Mr. Roll spending a full day showing around last April when they considered having it at, at the uh, elementary also. I mean, it, and Mr. Henderson and, uh, <laughs> at the secondary building. So this really, oh man. Uh, you'd be surprised. I want to say that they made a trip up here at least four times prior to, to Tuesday's all night setup. And then the whole deal on, on Wednesday, so it was quite a big deal. And I think our kids, while they may not recognize now, um, down the road they'll see how special that was to be able to, to, to be part of that. So I, I will tell you after some talk today at the office, um, I found out we were the second school district to host this, and I believe it was a school district in Logan County. It was um, Bell Fountain. Bell Fountain, yeah. yeah. Um, they. <coughs> They heard four cases, and by the time the day was done, there were only 18 people. Yeah, this is the biggest crowd they've ever had at one of their off-site One of their staff members programs. Felt, thought that if we had 100, that they would have been happy with 100 participants, and we brought over 700 in yeah. in the three sessions. And they, were, they said it was like when they went to Logan County, it was like, well, we have better things to do than you know, we've got other stuff to do rather than sit here and and, and watch this. And at the last one, I guess there was only 18 people in the crowd. So. But they were very impressed with everything. And their message to the kids, I thought, was terrific. Yes. And absolutely. About, none of them have a silver spoon. They want a silver spoon in their mouth. A silver spoon with their education. And it was really tremendous for our kids to, to have the opportunity to do the question and answer with the justices before. Because none of the other groups that came in that day had that out. Um, took a lot of work on the Crawford County uh, Bar Association's behalf of uh, attorneys coming to the schools and talking with the kids and giving them an idea of what they were coming into. And I will tell you, uh, our students were the only ones to come prepared with questions. The justices heard five or six questions and every one of them come, came from the Bissar students, not one from our neighbors. Um, and I will tell you, during the debrief, you know, the, the follow-up afterwards, it was all of our kids asking the questions there too. I mean, they, they and they, um, you know, they were expected to, to, to dress the part, and they did. Um, they acted wonder, or their behavior was wonderful. Uh, the, the justices even commented about how what a good-looking uh, group of students it was. So, very, very well done. So, and uh, uh, with that, uh, that ends my report. Let's see. Anybody to address the board? Doesn't look like it. Huh? <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and go down to personnel certified staff items. President Stone, members of the board, my recommendation that you prove items A through D under the personnel classified or certified staff section of the agenda. We have a motion to accept the personnel certified staff items. So moved. <coughs> Any questions or comments? Roll call, please. Dr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Murder? Yes. Mr. Schieffer? Yes. Mrs. Stone? Yes. And we will go to our personnel classified staff items. President Stone, members of the board, it's my recommendation to approve items A through E under the personnel classified staff section. <coughs> we have a motion to approve the personnel classified staff items. So moved. Support. Questions or comments? <coughs> Roll call, please. Mr. Schieffer? Yes. Mr. Murray? Yes. Dr. Johnson? Yes. Mrs. Stone? Yes. 
And we will go to our business items. President Stokes, my recommendation you approve items A through N under the business section of the agenda. We have a motion to approve the business items A through N. So moved. Support. And here is your chance to tell us about the five year forecast. Five year forecast. And pull yeah. some paperwork out here if I may. In your packet, you won't receive a copy of the five year forecast or should have received, I should say. And I know there's, there's quite a few details tonight. We obviously have the new uh, budget house bill 59 that I'd like to kind of review where we're at this summer and where things, at least to date, have shaken out to for the district and where we're kind of heading. On page one of the five year forecast, I think it's important to draw attention. First and foremost, to line 6.10, which is uh, revenue or expenses uh, over or under. Basically, this forecast includes the new budget bill, House Bill 59. So, any new revenue that we're stated to receive in fiscal year 14 or 15 is included in this forecast. For fiscal year 14, the state of Ohio on June 25th, Legislative Services Committee forecasted for our district an increase of $517,991 for fiscal year 13 to 14 that we're going to receive this year. From fiscal year 14 this year to next year, it's an additional $924,000. That is included in this forecast, which results in this year continued deficit spending forecast of $188,975. With the additional revenue state aid coming next year, we're forecast at this point to be in the black by $107,000. So we trend the right direction next year. But bear in mind, we're getting approximately $1.4 million in increase in aid. We're still deficit spending this year and forecast to just basically with our size of a budget be break even next year. So we don't have a lot of room next year to wiggle from stay in that black zone, if you will. Key year for us is going to be fiscal year 2016. We just simply don't know at this point, are the increases that we've seen in House Bill 59 going to continue going forward? We forecasted that out to be flatlined at this point. We just simply don't know. We're hoping, and I'll talk about a few of the increases the state seeing that the economic headwinds have turned statewide so we're optimistic that, that we will continue to see favorable budget bills for the education sector but we simply don't know again our deficit spending for lack of a better, better word is off to the races in 2016 by a half a million dollars and it approximately doubles in 17 uh, which we get out to fiscal year 2018 and we're spending approximately 1.6 million more than we're bringing in. And at that point in time, that would place us below our comfort level or threshold of a 30 day cash reserve balance. So it's gonna be absolutely critical to monitor our expenses against revenue as, as we move forward and make the small adjustments now so that hopefully we can stave off any kind of critical or heart wrenching adjustments in the future. Again, it's very difficult to forecast out five years simply because there are so many unknowns. Um, I feel reasonably confident in this forecast. I did learn last night from Mr. Kimmel there's been a shift in our enrollment picture. I had forecasted basically a flat line trend from fiscal year 13 into fiscal year 14. Correct me if I get the figure wrong, but I believe we are at a total of 92 net loss for this year based on our preliminary October count week data. In addition to what we were already getting a hold before. In addition, correct. Which is approximately $530,000 in lost revenue to the district as we move forward. So again, we're doing everything we can within the fiscal office to hold down expenses and manage it and turn over every stone. But the biggest unpredictable source of decreasing revenue is the decline in enrollment. So we're we're actively aware of that. We're working hard to manage that, and, and we're diligent in that regard. In October, uh, the Ohio Department of Education finally released their estimates or, or their chart of where House Bill 59 was going to shake out. 
compared to the Legislative Service Committees in June, and there was a lot of concern that there was going to be huge variability between them. For our district, the variance is approximately $26,000, or a third of a percent, basically. The negative bias that's shown there with the decrease is likely due to the final fiscal year 13 ADM figures, or our student population, versus the estimate that was used in May. Um, again, they just didn't hard, have hard data points. I'm pleased that the variance isn't larger, given the overall trend with our enrollment that we now know about today. Inside the forecast, I referenced some of the trends that, that we're seeing statewide that I think translate into favorable budgets in the future if they continue. Again, the Kasich administration has shown a desire to midway through a biennium budget do a review, and if the trends and the data that they're seeing isn't favorable, they will adjust that down, which could negatively impact us. In the, in the forecast, you'll see there's two graphs uh, that chart the revenues for the state through fiscal year 13, and now they're exceeding the fiscal year 2008 tax revenue levels, which is, I guess, when the economic downturn began to occur, began to show up statewide. The recovery of the labor market's gonna be the biggest significant factor for us to pay attention to, and, and you'll note on page three below that, the statewide unemployment average in July was 7.2%, but for Crawford County, it was at nine. So locally, we have some headwinds. Again, we can increase our revenue through an increase in student population or increasing revenue through taxes on our local constituents. And at this point in time, I just don't think the trends are in our favor for that economically. Uh, with the House Bill 59, they've, they've removed the homestead exemption, which has been in place since the 70s and places another significant burden on the local tax base. Those that have it now on our current levies are grandfathered in, but any new monies that we would go after would basically be a 12.5% increase or additional that the, the state's not gonna chip in for that our local base would have to pick up. In fiscal year 16, we're gonna face another reevaluation in the district. Again, I, I hammered home that that's kind of a key year for us. We're hoping that the trend of the, the downward revision of 12.5% this past year is behind us and that we can begin to move forward, but we don't know. I'm forecasting flat line growth, trying to be conservative in that regard, hoping for the best uh, that we've seen the, the economic shakeout on our property valuation uh, that has hurt us. We get 69% of our revenue from the state, so we are heavily dependent on the outcome of the, the budget bills that come out of Columbus. Again. If you look at all the data points, if, if you go through these, we, we've charted this out and tried to lay it out in the best possible light. Moving forward to give you the trend statewide that will filter down to us as well. House Bill 59, uh, we spoke at our uh, business meeting earlier. The main word out of Columbus continues to be ed choice. And, and again, we heard tonight the, the testament about how well our program's doing seems to fall on deaf ears in Columbus. And, the community schools, the charter schools, the online academies, they continue to chip away and erode our student base, which hurts them academically, but then also hurts us financially. And again, Columbus seems to be focused on that choice, and they seem to be driven in that direction, continuing forward. House Bill 59 opens that up for even more exposure. So that, that's a risk that we face as well. I know I'm getting long-winded here, but the, the last piece of the puzzle, we're, we're doing some extensive work with our health insurance to drive that down and still offer the same level of coverage for employees that we have. The big unknown that's out there for us right now is the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. There's a lot of taxes that are rolled up and wrapped up in that plan, and right now, uh, effective January 1st, 2015, it could impact our rates, uh, an increase in our cost by as much as 2%. So it is substantial and it really hasn't borne out in the market yet what the Affordable Care Act's impact overall is gonna be on the rate structure itself. So in addition to the taxes and the fees that we're facing on our insurance plan, it could also negatively impact pools and grouping nationwide, statewide, which would impact us as well. So there's just a lot of headwinds and a lot of uncertainty as we look out moving forward. 
But I guess the general theme is we know what we're going to get from the state. It's heavily dependent, again, on our student levels. We're working hard to control our internal expenses. But we just don't know if the economic conditions are going to solidify moving forward. Reevaluations, taxes, and then state budget. Deficit spending is, is the highlight. I know we, we beat that drum for a while, and it's, it's never a good picture to have when you have a carryover. We've got to work diligently to try to rein that in, especially as we look out. So there's some large numbers that are chipping away at it. Questions? Everything else is good. It doesn't mean a lot, but as you look around and as I talk to other treasurers and look at forecasts, um, it could be a lot worse. It really could. And this, this forecast does not reflect simply because we won't see it until January 1st, the change in our insurance consortium. And, and that does have a material effect on this moving forward. I've, I've played around with the numbers to see what it's going to be. It's positive, although I will tell you that, that the enrollment figure I just learned of uh, backs off a large portion of that savings. So it's good we're able to realize that, but I wouldn't be surprised that it washes out if our enrollment doesn't, doesn't uptick a little bit. So school finance is you know, tough business in another state. And it's constantly moving out of it in all directions. Could not have said it better. I appreciate the, how, you, how much you're doing fighting for all the dollars to bring in and keep in the district. Appreciate that. Thank you. This was very well done. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, very wonderful analysis. The assumptions are all laid out. Wish there were better assumptions. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. I, I try to paint you the picture with what I work with on a regular basis. I'm hoping that you'll find kind of that, that statewide level helpful as well. I noticed that uh, in our case, our uh, salaries and benefits only amount to about 70%. That, that's significant, and that, that's... I'm glad you mentioned that. That is, I don't want to say unheard of, it is very well yes, managed. It's it, it's, it, it is, it's a good number to have. 72% when you look at the salaries and benefits for a district our size, we're not even approaching what I would consider to be red line. And, and we've obviously done a great job managing that. Typically you see that in the 80 to 85%, right. and you're really in that danger zone when you creep up into the 85%. And kudos to all of you for the management decisions you've made to hold that in check. It is a phenomenal number. Um, of all the assumptions you made, it sounds like declining enrollment is one of the biggest issues because that's one of the numbers in the formula that really drives the formula. It controls everything. Um, it, it's based on a, per student, uh, $5,745, $5,750 with some special ed component to that. It's, it's frustrating for all of these gentlemen sitting here, but it is simply the one piece of the equation I can't control. I mean, we have our fixed expenses, we have our staff, we have our, our utilities, and, and we're really fighting a battle. The education options program, we're hoping, begins to turn that around. I think we've heard success stories tonight. Um, but it is, it's the key driver. It, it, it does, everything you see here is related directly to that number. And I think it's a big enough issue for us that we need to bring key people together, key stakeholders together, and figure out a plan to deal with it. And I don't know whether it's just over enrollment or declining population or what, but it's having a significant impact. Every time we take two or three steps ahead in saving, we take another three or four steps back and what we lose in over enrollment or decline. Yeah, I mean, if the public understood the benefit of the step you folks have taken with the insurance and the savings you're gonna recognize and then to see all of that virtually wiped out by declining enrollment, it just, it's so frustrating. And, and I think everybody here, again, recognizes the importance of that and, and we're working on it. You know, a couple of pieces that, you know, Dr. Johnson, I mean, you, you brought up some points in the past, very positive changes, the middle school bell schedule change and, right. and separation. I, I think some of those have led to better climate and culture that secondary going, which I think leads to people being more satisfied with where they're at instead of looking for somewhere else to go. I do know that <clears throat> one of the biggest frustrations from my standpoint, I think the earlier we make a connection with families, the more likely we are to keep them. Okay. Uh, we had a 25 student waiting list this year for preschool that we couldn't educate. We had terminal life. 
we know that either A, they're going to find somewhere else to go and start their education, which we may never get them back, or B, they're not simply not getting any preschool experience anywhere, which is very, very frustrating by behalf. We're locked in size-wise at that elementary. In an ideal situation where money was an issue, we'd bring preschool back here to, to, to Lincoln. Part of the reasons we moved them is that the heating system was shot. We had no cooling system here. That's been corrected. We have neat, new heat, new cooling here. Um, uh, we have a few facility needs yet, restrooms on this side, but as far as new windows, new heat, new air, they could move back here. Some of the decisions that we need that to think about is, um, does the operational cost, custodian, food service, um, uh, Secretary slash uh, administrative oversight. Those cost is it is it worth moving to move back and expand it even? I know that preschool is not a money maker, but it's definitely um, puts us in risk of a lot more expenses down the road if we don't provide quality preschool education. And there's socioeconomic things that <coughs> all the research says quality preschool makes a difference for kids. From that time, <coughs> and so there's other settings that we can. If, if I can add, I know I've gotten long-winded here, but I think yes, the deficit spending is critical, and we need to continue to watch that and chip away at it. But I also don't think we want to become deer in the headlights with this forecast. When we still have students, we need to educate, and I think we need to effectively <coughs> invest our dollars into <coughs> like the educational options, and maybe. We don't want to turn our backs on the traditional model, but I think we need to continue to invest and use the resources that we do have to the betterment of the community. And, and we have those resources. We just need to be mindful of them as well and where we're heading. Yeah, um, we're going to make this brief. This right here is what's being proposed. Um, this is the summary. So I'm going to go through the summary. And if there's any policy you want me to dig into deeper, I will do that. Okay. Thank you. So please follow <laughs> follow along on this uh, copy sheet here. Okay. Uh, first page. I gave the administrators a copy of this too. The first three policies, 56301, has to deal with the positive behavior intervention support and limited use of restriction and exclusion. Those uh, policies are reflected there, and there is details in the pack if you want to read up on them. That's per uh, recent law. You have a copy. I, I've seen it. You've got a copy. I'm good. Uh, flipping to page two, uh, policy 1220, 1310, and 1520 are all the same thing. It gives the Board of Education an opportunity to assign duties that would typically be assigned to a business manager, to either the superintendent, treasurer, or another administrator. Uh, policy 1630, 3430, and 4430, FMLA, is on hold right now. You'll be getting that in the near future. Page 4, policy 1662, 3362, 4362, all three of those has to deal with Per um, recent changes in, uh, in, excuse me, due to a, a, a review from the Office of Civil Rights, they are requiring that districts have a compliance officer actually named in the policy instead of superintendent or principal. They want to see Kevin Kimmel, who you go to if there's an issue. So the policy changes basically puts my name on the line as being the person that's the compliance officer. Uh, policy uh, 2271 PS uh, post-secondary enrollment programs uh, due to House Bill 59 it changes the criteria or slightly changes or slightly addresses the criteria for taking part in uh, these type of programs. Are they no, or just no, it's just twice. It's just a it's a may instead of a shall. <laughs> so it's it doesn't change it uh, other than just a word change. Um, policy 2430. This has to deal with um, 
the whole piece about homeschooled students being allowed to take part in extracurricular activities. And basically, the, the best thing to, to, to know is the way we set the policy up is the same requirements that our students have that are in a traditional classroom would be the requirements of the homeschool students. We can't make them, we can't make them more restrictive. They have to be the same level of, of requirements as our regular students have. Uh, policy four, uh, 2431, um, this is a, a piece of the concussion head injuries, but it now covers uh, phys ed classes and intramural uh, sports, not just uh, extracurricular sports. Uh, policy 26 third, uh, 23 third grade reading guarantee, this is a revision. It provided uh, additional modifications that were required by uh, um, Senate Bill 21. Basically, it, changed, it's, it slightly tweaked uh, some pieces with special ed students and the teacher's requirement to, to, to teach kids that are on a, a reading and monitoring, a rent plan, reading improvement monitoring plan. And I look for that to continually change. And throw something in there, because right now, all of that is, is just now, at a quarter of the way in the school year, coming into focus. And some of our teachers are already asking, and we're looking at, okay, so now we've done this for this year. What about the, and we have one child who is officially a third grader, taking third grade reading instruction, but operating at a fourth grade level in math, science, and social studies, what happens if that, when that child is successful at passing, does she go to fourth grade? Like now, she would be in fourth grade for the balance of the year, and then you look to go on to fifth grade. What if she doesn't, is not successful on this, on this one or the one in the spring, and there, we haven't gotten there yet. So it's still uh, very fluid. So interesting to, to keep an eye on. A policy 3120, this would allow somebody other than the superintendent to make a nomination to the board if um, the person up for employment is a relative of the superintendent. Uh, policy 3220, um, this basically is a whole piece where they switch profit or put skilled in and replace a proficient in the teacher evaluation. Also changed that any student uh, with regards to the growth measure will not affect a, a, a teacher's uh, evaluation it changed from 60 or more days of unexcused absence down to 45 or more days of absence. So it's just a slight change in the number of days. Uh, policy 5111, uh, uh, this would be dealing with, um, eliminates the automatic uh, uh, termination or end of a, a policy or a power of attorney granting parental rights to, and responsibilities to a grandparent. In other words, uh, if it's uh, something that's court ordered or something that's court placed, it doesn't uh, uh, terminate after a year, it's ongoing, unless there's another change in the court. Uh, policy 5310, health services. Uh, basically, physicians must assess a student, not other health care provider. We had a choice of picking another health care provider to clear a student to play if they were out for a concussion. I, or, uh, we really feel that that needs to be a, an actual physician, not a, not a nurse practitioner or somebody like that. If you have strong feelings, another way we'd have a discussion about that. Uh, policy 5340, uh, this is the uh, same as uh, policy 5310. It is tasked to deal with um, uh, student accidents. Um, so it just addressing two different places of the policy. Uh, 5513 care of school property. Um, this is a piece where uh, has to deal with the juvenile uh, judges' orders. Um, oh, I know what it is. When a kid, let's say a kid gets court placed in another school district, you can't hold the records in home school for any reason. You, know, you used to be able to hold it if they owed fees or things like that. Court placement, you must send the records. Okay, policy 5517, anti-harassment. Basically, this is a whole piece where you have to we have to list exactly who the compliance officer is. Um, so uh, uh, that will be me. 
policy uh, 6152 student fees, fines, and charges. Um, once again, that's the same piece where you can't uh, hold uh, records if somebody were to get court placed. Uh, policy 7300, uh, this is, has to deal with uh, uh, limits how funds are derived from the sale of real property. There's certain things you have to take care of uh, if, with the money that you make off of selling property. Uh, 8210, this has to deal with the whole days to hours with regards to the minimum number of school days. Um, we'll be dealing with that uh, throughout the, the course of this year, looking at uh, school calendars going forward. What, just real, what do you hear out there about what districts are going to do with that? Well, basically, they, they, they put a limit, they put a certain minimum number of hours. I think, I think for example, high school is 1,100 hours. Now, what's unclear is what time, you know, like, do you start at 7.50 and you're in school till 2.50, does every one of those minutes count? No, you got to take lunch out. And so it's, it's, it's a calculating nightmare to figure out <coughs> we're very close to the time. In other words, uh, there is no calamity days anymore. Once, uh, once you have set your calendar, you have to meet the middle number of hours. If you, if you have more hours built into your calendar, you wouldn't have to make those days up, but once you drop below that minimum hour requirement, you would be required to make more days. Make so if you days. drop below 1,100 or whatever, then you have to start making them up. Yeah, if you if you pass a policy, which I think takes quite a bit of uh, uh, public hearings and things like that to reduce the number of hours, they don't want to see anybody drop down what they currently have now, right. but it could be done, you could go down the minimum number of hours, but then if you were to miss a snow day, you would be required to make that, that day up right away. If you pass a policy that says we're going to be, or pass a calendar that's at 1,400 hours, and you miss a half a dozen days, and it doesn't drop you below the 1,100, you're still okay. What about things like uh, early release for? That doesn't. I mean, that those times not in session would not count towards your your number of hours. Okay. So our Wednesday times are going to be less than what our Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday times are. I did a quick calculation. I think we're okay, but we only have. I believe I believe we're over 20 hours right now. Is it 20 hours? Just a couple, just a couple days. days. Yeah. Well, so what happens if you build a calendar? If you build it in for a maximum number of hours and have no plan to do? Do you then cut back toward the end of the school year, or you start shortening up days, or, or is that flexible they, enough as you can consider? Well, what they what they do is they, they tell you that they, they don't want to see they, you're not to go below. And by the way, there are restrictions. You can't go some some days. A week. It is Monday through Friday. Um, they put some restrictions in there. Uh, they even talk about like the Cedar Point piece there, where they can't go. You know, but I don't know if that's actually actually came through or not. Um, can't start school flat for a certain day. But um, what they want to see is that you have the same number of hours in the day schedule as compared to the hour schedule, and then once you set that number, let's say it's 1,300 hours, if you start missing days, as soon as you drop below the 1,100, then you have to make it up. But I don't believe that there's anything like you set the number of days or number of hours and you get to the end of the year, you haven't used any planning days, they don't want to see you taking the last five days off of school. You know, it doesn't work the other way. If you don't use it, you can get back. It's yeah, interesting. The option in, <clears throat> they discussed there for a while, but like Moodle or online, a certain, certain percentage of students make up work online, that would count your hours for that day instead of making them up at a different time? You know, that was a whole blizzard bag piece where they yeah. uh, uh, they allow schools to count out those as uh, days in session. Um, I don't know with this change from days to hours how that affects that. I'm not sure what that. I would anticipate if they if it would count uh, uh, if they weren't in session and students did complete work online, uh, it would count as a day in session. So you probably have like a flipped classroom Friday and not have anybody show up but do stuff online at home. Probably, yeah. <laughs> yep. What you call it? Flip? Flipped. Yeah. Flip. Flipped. Okay, yeah. flipped classroom. Okay. <laughs> oh, policy 30 or 8390 deals with animals. On district property. <laughs> uh, a lot of times you get service animals, service dogs. Um, we've had that over the years with, with students that were blind or parents that were blind coming in. Um, the interesting piece is then policy 80, 
405 actually deletes language about animals in the classroom because it's addressed in the new policy right above. It. And then uh, policy 8462, student abuse and neglect. Um, this is a whole piece where we must provide youth su suicide awareness prevention and the mandatory in-service education for district staff. We actually were ahead of that last year. We did the uh, piece at least at the secondary building on the um, um, help me science of suicide. suicide program and then uh, we actually put a hold on the wellness piece because our policy 8510 we've done quite a bit of work over, over the time so I didn't want to rush into that I want to take some time and work with it through our wellness committee there is some slight changes they have in there but I don't know how the new changes affect what policy we've worked on very hard to, to put in place so do not be set up a meeting to talk with the folks that helped in the past to develop that policy. And then the last piece, uh, 9160, public attendance at uh, school events. This has to deal with animals at district events, service animals. Oh, one, one more thing. The back of page uh, 11 there, um, policy uh, 9270, um, education outside of schools, basically homeschool students being allowed to take part in um, uh, athletics again. Now, in addition to this language, though, wouldn't students still have to meet the criteria set forth by the OHSAA as far as uh, being enrolled or no. receiving five credits? No, or that's gone. A certain GPA? What they've done, uh, because the old policy for the, with the OHSA said that you had to be enrolled in at least one course uh, in, a, in a school. In order to be eligible for interscholastic activities, that's not the case anymore. Uh, they've really taken it out of the hands of the OHSA and said you're not allowed to set any policy that would prohibit a kid being in a homeschool situation uh, taking part in athletics. But we can set; they have to they have to meet the local board of education's criteria, which would mean for us they'd have to pass a, a, a drug screen. They'd have to have a, have passed an X number of credits in the, pr in the previous uh, grading period and must have had at least a 2.0 GPA. So we'll get a score, we'll get a, a report card from the parents if they're homeschooling uh, to determine their athletic eligibility. Okay, so do we have anybody at this time? Homeschooling wise, I do not believe we do. We do have, we have had uh, students at Holy Trinity that uh, if their school parochial school do, does not have that sport, they are allowed to uh, play athletics in our school system and not be attending the school at our school system. We had that in the fall. Now, it used to be that homeschool parents had to submit a plan to the Board of Education yes. and the superintendent annually, mm -hmm. be approved by the school district, yes. and then some evidence of evaluation Assessments, by right. an accredited person. Mm -hmm. So that all still That's holds. still a case place, yeah. So in, in a lot of ways, it sounds like for these kids, you're going to have to really be on top of that whole thing. Right. Yeah. And we do. We have about a dozen students right now in our school system that are home, truly homeschooled. Remember, homeschool is not community school. Community right. school community school students still are not allowed to take part in extracurricular activities. Okay. So track at ECOT, Ohio Virtual Academy, those 94 kids we have in bar going, going to community school, they're not allowed to play sports at our school unless they enroll with us. So. Uh, the last piece there, uh, policy 9700 relations with special interest groups. Basically, it's a little change in policy with regards to what type of um, paperwork can be passed out to students um, through the school system. And every once in a while, we get that a couple times a year where we have a special interest group that, that would like to um, have us pass information out to our students. And we're very careful with uh, allowing that to happen. There's a difference between posting something and actually physically putting it in the kids' hands or in their book bags. And we get a lot of that at the elementary. We can make it available for them to pick up, but we're not going to force uh, materials, especially when, you, when you're on the thin line between separation of church and the state. So. Any questions on the uh, the summary of the reports or, or anything that you'd like to look at uh, further before the board votes next month on these? I'd be more than happy to provide for you in between now and the next meeting. Also. If the, and by the way, on the SkyDrive, this, the actual, this, this information is on SkyDrive. So if you want to look at 
details of the policy that's in, uh, available for you. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.